With the peace of the Lord be with you this morning. Uh, we will continue the message that we started last week. And uh, it has to do with the church on the move. And uh, last week we talked about what was it that we were taking with us and what are we leaving behind. But in the, today's segment, we want to talk about uh making sure that god goes with us in whatever we do that's the essential thing the most important thing to do and so i want to make sure that we get on the right page on that but i want to talk to you about an incident that happened with israel as you recall uh, they were at one point when um, they were waiting for moses to uh, come up with the commandments that the Lord has given and while they were waiting they started going back to their old ways of of uh, serving a the golden calf as you recall and uh, God was so angry with them he said well I'm going to keep my word but essentially what he was saying and um, give you the, the the land of milk and honey but I'm not going with you because I'm so angry with you that I'm afraid that I will kill you along the way. Can you imagine getting God so angry that he just doesn't even want to be in the same place with you? Obviously they were starting off wrong. And uh, one of the things that we need to do is make sure that as we move before forward, we too will not be taking with us things that are not appropriate and not fulfilling in God's um, ministry. Well, with that said, I wanna go ahead and go back and share my desktop here. And um, talk about the message that's prepared here ahead of time. Okay, so it is a church on the move and um, Moving with God. So this is part two of what we were talking about last time around. And the, the lead verse is in Exodus 33, verse 3. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. Well, it was interesting, you know, because here Israel got, had gotten God so angry that he just wanted to send them on their way and forget about them. He didn't want to be a part of them anymore. And I think it's interesting the, the, the uh, response they gave him. They could have, they could have said, well, okay, well, it's, I guess we need to get going and uh, leave God behind, but they didn't want to do that. They decided that they wanted to find a way to take God with them. But let's ask ourselves a few questions here. Is God fed up with us too? I mean, God can get fed up with people and people don't realize that. Believe it or not, sometimes God does get fed up with people, he does get fed up with us. If you had to rely on someone in an important mission, you would expect that person to be responsible and trustworthy. And that doesn't always happen among us. We get distracted by priorities. When God destroys everything that you are familiar with, and he takes away all the things that you thought were important, he does that in order to get our attention. Um, last night, for example, I, at, I was watching some of the um, NFL draft, and it occurs to me 
But there was a time where the NFL and the footballs games and everything was so important, but it had a greater priority for me in, in many ways. Of course, I, I did everything else I should too, but God has taken that away. They're drafting people into become, in, being a part of a team that they don't know when will, they will play and where they will play and who will go see them. So God has become even more and more the focus in my life and hopefully in yours as well. But we have so many distractions now that it makes it very difficult for God to get through to us. And because of that, we're not always constant as we ought to be. We don't always please God in the things that we do. Sometimes um, we want to have it both ways. We want to have a, a great time in this world. But we also want to serve God. Sometimes there's a conflict of interest. And God feels like he needs to get our attention. And I think he's doing that now. To be honest with you, there's a lot of people that will eventually go back to their old ways. I know that. But that doesn't mean that all of us should. God's true people should be constant in the things that they do. When God gets so angry with us that he feels that he has to distance himself from us to avoid destroying us, well, that's pretty bad, isn't it? Imagine getting to that point where God can be so angry with us and so disappointed in us. I think he does that even not with us. Um, even though that we feel like we're all having a higher standard than other people. I think we still let him down as well. And I don't think we're as constant as we ought to be as well. But getting to that point where God has to distance himself from people, that about is, is as low as you can get. Think about it. He took away our, our ability to go shopping normally. Well, we can go to the grocery store, but you can't go to the mall. You can't even go to school. Some people can't go to work. Some people have lost their jobs. Some people have been laid off. I'll be honest with you, one of the things that I miss about work was driving to and fro. I enjoy driving in the car and going from here to there. But I think sometimes those things become so important to us that we need to take some time off. And maybe this is a great blessing from us, for us to be able to take this time to reflect and to see what our priorities are so that God will not be as fed up with us as he has been. Another question is, what must the church do to get close to God again? What must we do? There's seven things I came up with here that I wanna discuss with you, which will be the, the basis for the rest of this message this morning. And as I asked them, I asked them not just of you, but I asked them of myself and anyone else that wants to see or read or listen to this later on. The number one thing that I think we should do is to feel your emptiness without God. And that's what Israel did. In Exodus 33, verse 6, it says that the Israelites stripped off all their ornaments at Mount Horeb. They stripped everything off. When the people of Israel stripped off their ornaments, it symbolized the deep emptiness they felt without God. 
it was like telling God that nothing in this world mattered but him. And as we prepare ourselves to move forward, we need to strip away anything that has been distracting us from God. Sometimes God will take away the things that we love the most. If your car was so important to you, God might take that car away from you. If your job was more important to you than God, that became a priority. He will take that as well. If your education was more important, that would go as well. There is nothing that matters more than the Lord. So Israel got to the point where they symbolically said, I'm stripping away everything that I have so that I can feel my emptiness without God in my life. In our case today, in the world we're living in now, God has stripped away those things of himself. If you ask yourself that, haven't you noticed that how true that is? Everybody wants so desperately to get back to the old way and get back to, to doing things that we did before. But I kind of have to wonder just how, how important is that? Number two, have a face-to-face -face talk with God. And of course, we don't see God face to face like Moses did. But we can definitely pray to him in the morning or evening or in the quiet solitude of our day. Exodus 33:11a says, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to, with his friend. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we felt like we could honestly look at God and say, God, we're friends. We come from a place where we are enemies of God. And after we come out of that environment, being an enemy of God, we draw nearer to him. We need to seek God daily every day seek his face daily i know my martha wants to do that and my wife martha wants to do that in in the in the night time but i prefer to do that in the early morning of you know as i get up really early in the morning and i like to face the lord you know most people can't face god because they know that he knows everything about them Come to God, you know, and know that he knows everything about you. Too often, we got into a place where we think we can fool God just like we fool the world. It doesn't work like that. You can't fool God. God knows everything about us. But in spite of the fact that he knows everything about us. God still loves us. He wants to hear from us. So as we prepare to take our case before the Lord, clean up our thoughts, all the aspects of our life so that he can receive us. And that's something that I, I challenge myself to do daily. So let's look at number three. Don't leave until you've connected with God. Exodus 33, 15 says, Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. So we don't want to move forward without God. I've had discussions with some of you before recently. And we believe that this downtown downtime is, a, is an appropriate thing. It's a good thing. 
it means that the Lord has leveled the playing field. The Lord has stripped everything bare. And now we're trying to see what's next. And someone also told me maybe the Lord is finding a building for us and it's not available to us. And therefore we need to take time to reflect. But in the case of Moses, he said, we're not going any place without you, Lord. Moses knew that nothing was worth having without God being a major part of it. I dare say that there are churches today that God has, has very little to do with what's going on in the service. Instead of challenging the sheep and the, and, the, and, and the lambs of God, sometimes we're entertaining the goats, as they say, compromising things so that everybody's happy and we keep everybody in the seats. Just how much will we, would anybody need to compromise to keep everybody there? What good was a land of, of milk and honey or a new home if God is not a part of it? We need to reflect on the essential things that we need to do for the Lord. Knowing what it is that we need to do <clears throat> before we actually get to where we need to go. And refuse to rise from prayer in the morning until you feel that you're connected with your Heavenly Father. That's the way I pray. When I pray, I want to keep praying until I feel I've connected in some way. And some of us will connect in a different way. Some of us will get the, the impression that we've connected. Well, for me, it's like these warm and fuzzy feelings, you know, that I feel an inner peace and joy in my life. For others, it might be something completely different. I don't know. We're all very different. And we all know that we all need to connect with the Lord. So don't just get down on your knees and pray in the morning and just say a few words and just get up and leave. Make sure you've connected with your Heavenly Father before you move on to your day. So let's look at number four. Ask God to show us His glory as well. That's what Moses said. In Exodus 33, 18, he says, and Moses said, now show me your glory. When he understood that God had received him, he had heard him, and he acknowledged him, then he wanted to show, he wanted God to show him his glory. God knew that Moses was asking for this because he loved the Lord so much that he desired him more than anything else in the world. So as you and I connect with God through hope, faith, and patience, ask him to show us his glory as well in our lives. Show us that he's part of it. How do we know we have actually are able to move on? How do we actually know that God has heard us and he is pleased with us. Well, that leads us to number five. Let God reveal himself through our faith. Sometimes faith in God means that good things can come from bad things. Romans 8.28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. And there's also this in Philippians 1.19. I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. 
So, and the way that God reveals himself to us is by increasing our faith. Some folks are happy not having to deal with a, re, a, a very difficult relationship. But I'll be honest with you. When I started off in ministry, I didn't think I was worthy to be a minister. But when God convinced me that I need to be a, a minister, I understood that he just selected me, chose me to do that. And I can't let him down. And I need to keep serving until I die. I thought I was through for a while there. And I think some people did as well. But apparently God is not through with me. And I know that even the things that we're going through right now in our struggles, in our difficulty, that we're facing in life and the uncertainty of life. We too need to understand that God will do this for a greater good. When I was in the war, I get up in the morning to face my day. And I didn't think about, oh, I'm gonna die today. I'm gonna get shot today. I'm going to get killed today. I just thought, what, Lord, and, and my, my simple little prayer was, Lord, use me in the way that you think is best. Let me make a difference in this world for you. Magnify yourself in my life that I might accomplish a greater good. And so even though I knew that the, the possibility that death was around the corner, I didn't worry about that. I was more concerned about doing the right thing for the Lord. And as I get up in the mornings today, I'm not worried about dying, I'm not worried about getting sick, but I'm no more bulletproof than I was before. I know that the Lord will use me and I know that he will continue to bless me in my efforts to serve him because I serve him with my heart and not for a pur not for any other purpose. It's not for money, not for glory, not for anything that is going to make me greater than the Lord. And God reveals himself daily in this effort of serving him. Number six, trust in God's provision. God will provide. Sometimes we're wondering how we're going to make ends meet. We're, we're running around looking for a place to buy toilet paper, tissues, and, and, and food, and, and eggs, and milk. Well, actually, one of the things that we have a great abundance of is milk and oil. They're actually dumping the milk in the, in the fields now, they say, because there's so much of it. But God will provide. So we don't need to worry about tomorrow. You may be sitting around worried about a building. And sometimes I catch myself worrying about getting the right people in place to do God's will, to serve in this ministry because I don't think we have everyone that we need just yet. Matthew 6, 34 says, take therefore no thought for tomorrow. For the morrow will take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the, is the evil thereof. But isn't that what they're doing today? People are overstocking their they're buying up all the supplies of everything they can think of because they're so worried about the sufficiency of things. Instead of th thinking about 
making sure that we are turning to God with all our heart so that he will be the one that provides. But remember that manna that the Lord provided from Israel, for Israel? They still had to gather it, but when they wanted more, it came to nothing. But you notice that they were told, don't get up on the Sabbath and go pick up that manna. But some did it anyway, and they didn't find any. And some kept it beyond what they, they needed to. They overstocked, and it came to nothing. It rotted away. And so ask yourself in these times of, um, of having to deal with this, this virus that's among us, around us, finding a way to trust that the Lord will provide. But are you still struggling to have more than you need? Is it possible that maybe you're trusting more in yourself than you are with God in God. It seems like when bad situations like this happens in, in, in life, it just seems like um, it brings out the best in some people, but also the worst in other people as well. And this leads us to the last step here. Number seven, as we move forward in taking God with us and hoping he will not ang be angry with us, let us make God our priority in all things. Matthew 6.21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So in the environment that we find ourselves, God has stripped away all the things that we thought were so important to us. But what rem remains after everything perishes is the relationship we have with God. And we need to make God a priority. We need to make him the most important element and part of our life. In and sometimes we raise up idols in our hearts that take place in the place of God. And that is such a sad thing for God to hear and to see. My prayer is that all of us will not refuse to move without God. Refuse to move forward without him making him our priority, knowing and believing that God is the most important part of our lives. And we all say that, but how do our actions personify that? How does it show that? Are we actually doing that? I wonder how sincere we really have been in everything that we do. And this is not a, a, um, a message to judge anyone, of course. Uh, one of my early mentors that I had long ago, was a, a pastor that married Martha and I. It was Elder Trinidad Padilla. He used to say this all the time. Whenever you point forward to people, there's one finger that points back, one, one finger that points to people, but all four other fingers point back to you. So with that thought in mind, know and understand that the Lord holds all of us accountable. I think he holds ministers accountable even more. And I, I know that ministers are not any more um, prepared or perfect in all things than anyone else. But we know that 
the Lord is calls people that he, he needs and he will magnify and bless whatever it is that he wants to accomplish in your life. Ask God for a ministry. Ask God for ways that you can serve him and make a difference in this world. I will continue to serve my, my Lord. And those of you that know me well enough will know that what is driving me to serve him is nothing more than my love for God. Seeking to do things that will bring reward in the next life. Let us consider the fact that this church on the move will not move anywhere without God, making him the most important thing. I'd like to close with a prayer and ask that you bow with me as we go into a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this time you've given us to be together. We know, Lord, that we are far from perfect on our own ways and our own abilities. But we're perfect in the sense that you complete us. <clears throat> you make us the kind of people you want us to be. And you cover us with grace as you fill us with your presence. Abide with us now, Lord, for we too will not move without you. For there is nothing more important than service to you, my Lord. We commit ourselves, not just today, but every day of our lives. I thank you, Lord, because you have been a part of my life for so long. And I ask that you will continue with me, not just today, but from this moment on. And all of those that will join us in the days ahead and the years ahead, we ask that you will be a blessing unto them as well. It is in Christ's name we pray.